Miyazaki family were well known for operating a regional newspaper company, and during this time, his father was head of the business. Tsutomu Miyazaki came from a relatively wealthy family, and expectations were high on him. Due to his parents always being preoccupied with work, young Miyazaki had a poor connection to his parents, especially his father. Therefore, he was raised mainly by his grandfather, perhaps the only person who saw eye to eye with the young child. His early years were perhaps not the best, having been born with a rare birth defect causing him to have restrained mobility in his hands. He was ostracized by the other kids at the Itsukaichi Elementary School. At school, Miyazaki would be teased for his deformity, and thus he would keep to himself, shutting others out, consequently not making many friends. Teachers and classmates would remember young Miyazaki as being quiet and a lonely child. Having endured several years of solitude and loneliness, he attended the Medai Nakano High School in Nakani, a well-known and prestigious high school associated with the Meiji University. Despite of being unpopular and lonely, Miyazaki was quite the gifted student up until that point. However, suddenly his grades would start to plummet, seemingly out of nowhere thus ranking him in the 4th place out of 56 students in his class, and he did not receive the customary admission to Meiji University. This shattered Miyazaki's plan to study English and become a teacher. Instead, he was forced to attend a local junior college and studied to become a photography technician. There, he continued studying to the spring of 1983, when he graduated, five years before the incidents. Following his graduation, he started working at a printing plant owned by an acquaintance of his father. After three years there, he moved back into his parents' house in Itsukaichi, sharing a room with his elder sister. As mentioned, the Miyazaki family were quite influential in the Itsukaichi district of Tokyo. Tsutomu Miyazaki's father was quite a workaholic and therefore was more interested in his business rather than his relationship with his son. Miyazaki's mother also worked long hours, however she tried to compensate by buying Miyazaki gifts, like his infamous Nissan Langley. Miyazaki's two younger sisters, Setsuko and Haruko, simply despised their brother. Being treated like the black sheep of the Miyazaki family, he once stated, if I try to talk to my parents about my problems, they just brush me off. I even thought about suicide. Perhaps the only saving grace and the sole person that kept Miyazaki in check was his grandfather, who treated him like family. In May of 1988, Miyazaki's grandfather would pass away just three months before the first murder case. The only person that cared and was fond of Miyazaki has now passed away. In hindsight, many people would believe that this might have been the trigger for the following events. The now 26-year-old Miyazaki would become unhinged and commit several obscure and gruesome acts. In a twisted attempt to retain something from his now deceased grandfather, he resorted to consume part of his grandfather's ashes, marking the start of his disconnect with the world. A couple weeks later, one of Miyazaki's younger sisters caught him staring while she was taking a shower. Infuriated and disgusted, she demanded Miyazaki to leave. Offended, he entered the bathroom and attacked her sister smashing her head into the wall. When his mother found out about this, she demanded that Miyazaki spend more time working instead of watching whatever videos and reading manga in his room. Offended, once again, he beat up his mother. Four-year-old Marie Kono vanished on her way home after playing at a friend's house. Suspicious and anxious about his daughter's whereabouts, 
Marie Kono's father notified the police. A police force was soon to be dispatched, surveying the area and warning parents to keep the child in sight. However, the police was too slow. By that time, Miyazaki had already kidnapped Kono into his Nissan Langley and driven westwards of Tokyo. Parking under a secluded wooden bridge, he sat alongside Kono for half an hour before strangling her. The twisted Miyazaki then engaged in necrophilia with the corpse. Once finished, he dumped the body in the hills near his home. He kept Kono's clothes and drove home. Letting the body decompose for a while, Miyazaki went back to remove her hands and feet, which he kept in his closet at home. The remaining bones were turned to ash and grounded into powder. He sent those ashes alongside photos of her clothes, several of her baby teeth in a box, and a postcard which read, Mary, cremated, bones, investigate, prove. After Miyazaki watched the police announce their discovery, he sent the Kono family a confession letter detailing his crimes. Before I knew it, the child's corpse had gone rigid. I wanted to cross her hands over her breast, but it wouldn't budge. Pretty soon, the body gets red spots all over it. Big red spots, like the Hinomaru flag. After a while, the body is covered with stretch marks. It was so rigid before, but now it feels like it's full of water and it smells. How it smells, like nothing you ever smelled in this whole wide world. Mary Connell's case had a big impact on the community. The police spent large resources searching for the girl, dispatching 50,000 lost person posters along the train, subway and bus stations across the nation. In September, Sayama Hikari Gakuen Kindergarten started a new term without Connor. One mother recalled, from the time Marvi disappeared until Miyazaki was caught, parents without fail led the children to kindergarten every day. Not getting caught by the police, Miyazaki arrogantly plotted his next move. Only six weeks after Mary's disappearance, he struck again. Driving through Hano in the Saitama prefecture one afternoon, he spotted seven-year-old Masami Yoshisawa. Miyazaki had offered her a ride home, which she accepted. He drove towards the hills above Komine Path, the same scene of his first murder. There, he strangled Yoshisawa to death. Thereafter, he quickly stripped her before the rigor mortis set in, and like a pig, sexually abused her body. Soon after her disappearance, search parties were sent out across the area. Yoshisawa's face stared down from the posters, and the police had interviewed locals, but yet again, there was no clues. Erika Namba was returning from a friend's house. Coincidentally, Miyazaki drove past her and forced her into his car. The drive towards the parking lot in Naguri, Saitama, would be the last thing Namba would remember. At the parking lot, Miyazaki forced Namba to take off her clothes in the back seat and began taking pictures of her. By this time, Namba was crying. In an attempt to quiet down the girl, Miyazaki held her kicking body down with his weight as he strangled her. By 7 p.m., the girl was dead. He proceeds to tie her hands and feet behind her back using a nylon string and carefully wrap the corpse in a sheet and put it in a trunk. This time, he disposed the clothes in the woods behind the parking area and drove off. A week after the murder, the Namba family received a postcard sent by Miyazaki with a message assembled using words cut out from magazines. Erika, cold, cough, throat, rest, death. Miyazaki had murdered three young girls by this time, and police began to get suspicious. They immediately connected Namba's disappearance with that of Kano and Yoshizawa. 13th of December, a worker at the Nagari Youth Nature House 
found some of Damba's clothes and the search for clues began. During this time, the police began to piece together the puzzle. All the girls were from Saitama Prefecture and all lived within 30 kilometers of each other. The case evolved into a serial murder case. Something that the police found in common with the affected families were that all had been disturbed by strange and creepy phone calls. The phone would ring, but when answered, it was all silence, just heavy breathing. The one initial disappearance of a child has now turned into serial disappearance. Hardly a day passed without reports of the cases on television. The discovery of Erika Namba's body was the last drop as the parents of Saitama fell into a state of panic and distress. An Asahi Shinbun editorial at the end of 1988 pictured the state of anxiety of the situation. We must depend on the police, so we add our plea. Investigators, redouble your efforts. Miyazaki would stray away from murder until the following summer. However, that did not mean he changed. During this time, Miyazaki was impatient. He skipped work and sat cross-legged in his smelly room editing his precious videotapes. On June the 6th, he was headed off to the tennis courts at Ariake, near Tokyo Bay. However, the courts were closed. In a nearby park, he encountered five-year-old Ayaka Nomoto playing alone. Miyazaki had asked Nomoto if he could take pictures of her. He proceeded to take several shots until Nomoto refused to him. It was at this moment Miyazaki said, Let's take some pictures inside the car. He drove some 800 meters away from the park, and Nomoto innocently did not understand the situation she was in, and even commented on Miyazaki's deformed hands. Enraged, he put on some clothes and strangled the child. He tied her hands with the vinyl rope, taped her mouth and then wrapped the corpse in a sheet and put it in the trunk of his car. This time, however, was a bit different from his usual way of method. He took the body to his home and stripped off the clothes from the body. The corpse was laid down on the kotatsu table and Miyazaki continued to abuse the body. He would spend the next two days engaging in sexual acts with it until the corpse began to decompose. Miyazaki would then dismember it, abandoning the torso in a cemetery and her head in the nearby hills. He kept her hands as he would drink the blood and cannibalize them. Realizing the dangers of having the remains so near his house, he retrieved them two weeks later and stored the torso and head in his bedroom. The bones would be thrown into woods. The hair, clothes and sheets were burned. Almost a full year after his first murder, Miyazaki would finally get arrested. On the 23rd of July, 1989, Miyazaki spotted two sisters playing in near a public wash stand in Hachiyoji. Having managed to separate the elder nine-year-old sister from her younger sister, Miyazaki lured her to the river. History was awaiting to repeat itself. However, the quick thinking of the nine-year-old elder sister might have saved her sister's life. As Miyazaki was caught off taking nude pictures of the girl, the elder sister ran home to notify her dad who ran towards the scene only to find an aroused Miyazaki focusing his camera lens between the girl's legs. The father of the girls attacked Miyazaki but was not able to restrain him. After a while, Miyazaki returned to the scene to retrieve his Nissan Langley. Rightfully so, he was ambushed by the police and promptly arrested for the charge of forcing a minor to commit indecent acts. 17 days later his arrest, Miyazaki confessed to the murder of Ayaka Nomoto. The other confessions followed in succession. The first murder, Erika Namba, Mari Kono, and then Masami Yoshisawa. On September the 6th, Yoshisawa's remains were found in the forest near Komini Pass in Itsukaichi. The half-chewed bones of Mari Kono's hands and feet were discovered in the same area a week later thus 
finally giving the Kono family closure. A search of Miyazaki's two-room bungalow found 5,763 videotapes, all ranging from anime and slasher films to video footage and pictures of his victims. When his crimes were published, the media dubbed him the otaku murderer in reference of the otaku and anime culture in Japan. Subsequently, it raised questions against the culture, accusing it of being the fuel of his crimes and making him a murderer. Miyazaki's trial began on the 30th of March, 1990. During the trials, Miyazaki seemed nonchalant and disconnected from his gruesome crimes. It was as though he was indifferent for his acts. Often, he would talk about his alter ego, the so-called Ratman, which he blamed his actions on, claiming that it was him which made him a murderer. However, the trials couldn't begin before Miyazaki had defenders. His father refused to hire a lawyer for his son, claiming it wouldn't be fair to the victims. Subsequently, the public defender's office searched hard for someone that would be willing to take on the job. Eventually, two lawyers, Junji Suzuki and Keiji Iwakura, stepped up. The defender team's case revolved around the claim that Miyazaki did not have the mental capacity to understand his actions, suggesting that he was mentally ill, unable to choose between right and wrong. The court's first action was to assign a team of six psychology professors from Keio University to run tests on Miyazaki. They concluded that he was fully capable of taking responsibilities for his actions. Lawyer Junji Suzuki disagreed, stating, The more we see of him, the more we think he lives in a different world. We felt the reports did not establish Miyazaki's mental capabilities beyond reasonable doubt. So we asked for a second evaluation. Fortunately, the judge agreed. The second test had teams of court-appointed expert psychiatrists come to examine Miyazaki. They came to different conclusions. Two teams concluded that he was feeble-minded, one team were sure he was schizophrenic, and the last one suggested that he had multiple personality disorder. The Tokyo District Court judged him to be aware of the grief magnitude of his actions and crimes, therefore sentencing him to death on April the 14th, 1997. His death sentence was upheld by both the Tokyo High Court on June the 28th, 2001, and the Supreme Court of Justice on January the 17th, 2006. Spending his final years reading manga in the death row, Miyazaki was executed by hanging on June the 17th, 2008, after Minister of Justice Kunio Hatoyama signed his death warrant. The murder spree of Tsutomu Miyazaki costed four young girls their lives. Four-year-old Mari Kono, seven-year-old Masami Yoshisawa, four-year-old Erika Namba, and five-year-old Ayaka Nomoto. Hey, thank you so much for watching. This video was a bit longer than my usual ones, but I hope you don't mind. Also, if you enjoyed this video, I would greatly appreciate you liking this video as it helps me make more content just like this. As usual, stay curious, friends.